Right, so before we continue with any new material, we are going to look at a couple of questions that came from the Chinese audience. The first question is about the relationship between dependent origination uh, that is understood at the level of things being merely imputed by the mind and the law of cause and effect. So the first question is, is there a, a relationship between these two or not? And then a follow-up question, like taking this relationship between these two, why it is the case that we see that the results of some karmic actions are accomplished very quickly, whilst the results of other actions, it takes a very long time to come to maturation. Okay, so for the first question, the first question, um, we say that, first of all, we should be able to posit the presentation of the law of cause and effect for all phenomena. And at the same time, we must understand that phenomena do not exist from their own side. They are merely imputed by their mind. Unless we really understand that phenomena do not exist from their side and they are really imputed by the mind, we will not be able to properly um, set the presentation of the law of cause and effect. Something will not fall properly in place. Actually, if we take the position that phenomena are established from their own side, we will find that the presentation of law and effect is not actually sufficiently you know, working sufficiently. And we will see that there are many contradictions. And therefore, we have to recognize that the relationship between these two things, things being merely imputed by the mind and the law of cause and effect, is a very big and a very important relationship. Okay, so without going into too much detail, this is an initial level of addressing this question, and hopefully that is satisfying. Now, Geshe says, I'm not sure exactly if that answer satisfies the person who asked the question. So if uh, you don't feel satisfied with this answer, please feel free to follow up so that we can go into more detail into this subject. Okay, now with the second question, given that relationship between things being merely imputed by the mind and the law of cause and effect, the question is why do some karmic actions seem to bring about the result very quickly and other times not so quickly? The reason for that is because actually when we look into karma, we find uh, another three classifications of karma. We have karma whose results will be experienced in this life, karma whose results will be experienced in the life after this one, and karma whose result will be experienced in many future lifetimes far away from now. So when we talk about karma that will be experienced in this life, it means that you create the karma in this life and you also experience the result in this life. If this is not the case, we go into the second category where you create the karma in this life, but you will experience the result in the immediate life after this one. And again, if this is not the case, we're talking about karma that might manifest sometime in the future, many lifetimes from, from the life that the action was created. And the reason why we have these differences is due to the strength of karma. So first of all, the karma that is the strongest is the one that will manifest first. If two karmic actions have exactly are equal in terms of strength, then the one that will manifest first is the one with which we have the biggest familiarity. If again, the level of familiarity is the same between two actions, the one that will manifest first is the one that was done earlier. So the one that is accumulated earlier will bring the results earlier on. 
Okay, so we resume now going back to our text. So we are reflecting on the suffering of samsara. In that we have two outlines. If you can go into page 16, we have reflecting on the general samsaric suffering and reflecting on the specific suffering. So we are still doing reflecting the general samsaric suffering. And we say that this is presented under six uh, outlines. So we have the, su the suffering of uncertainty, the suffering of having no satisfaction, the suffering of casting off bodies repeatedly, the suffering of taking rebirth repeatedly, the suffering of descending from high to low states, and finally the suffering of having no companions. So last uh, class we started with the first one, the suffering of uncertainty. And we gave a story that illustrated that. We have one more story today. There was an Arhat who was uh, walking down the street. And as he was walking down the street, next to, on the side of the street, he saw um, an ox. And that ox was uh, taken to the slaughterhouse to be killed. And uh, through his clairvoyance, the Arhat was able to communicate with his ox and find the story. So the story was that in a previous life, this ox was a human and he was um, a businessman. He was quite wealthy, very, you know, the family was pretty well off. And this businessman actually relied on a worldly god and the worldly god requested that he perform some blood sacrifices. So every year that businessman was killing cattle in and was offering, making the blood sacrifices. He was doing this every year, year in and year out. When he came to the end of his life, he actually left this instruction to his son and said, whatever you do, you must continue with those blood sacrifices. And therefore, this became like a tradition in the family. And the family kept doing those blood sacrifices, killing cattle um, year after year to satisfy this deity. Um, and, uh, you know, this, um, there, so there was this pattern where they were killing animals. And then he was born again as an ox. Then he was killed. Then he was coming back as the human who was killing. And then again as the ox that was killed and so on and so forth. So now the sixth time that this ox human, reincarnated human was taken to the slaughterhouse. So this is a, again a story that illustrates the uncertainty in terms of our rebirths. So as you can see in this story, the story illustrates how there is no certainty in samsara because uh, this uh, protagonist of the story in a previous life was a big businessman, but later on he took rebirth as an ox. Uh, that was taken to be slaughtered. There is another story, again, that is mentioned in the sutras. Uh, so, again, in India, there was uh, this uh, householder, they, and they had cattle in uh, their family. And um, they had a really nice big bull, and he was quite attached to this bull. When he died out of his attachment, he was born as a little insect, like uh, that was attached to one of the wounds that the bull had. So the animals, you know, sometimes they have wounds and then insects uh, move in. So he was born, the human who owned this, was born as an insect that was dwelling in uh, the, in, you know, on the, on the animal. And then came a bird who ate that insect. And then he was reborn again as an insect who was attached again to the bull and so on and so forth. So again, it indicates, you know, from a human, he was born to as a little insect many times over. So as you can see with those stories that we have given, uh, you have uh, a human that takes a rebirth, a rebirth as, a, as an animal. And together with that, whatever like uh, qualities, knowledge, uh, education they had, all of that was lost. 
and uh, they ended up with a lower rebirth. But al although these stories are stories that indicate uncertainty by looking at examples of different lives, like from one life to the next, we can uh, um, observe this lack of uncertainty even within one lifetime. So early on in this life and later on in this life, you can see how people change their roles. There's no certainty in terms of who is going to be your friend or who is going to be your enemy. Like you could be very friendly together today with someone and at the end of the day you have a conversation and things get a little bit out of hand. You don't like what they say to you, you generate anger and by the next day you consider that person to be your enemy. It was your friend yesterday but it has become your enemy today. We even see uh, siblings within the same family. They are where they are very harmonious together and then all of a sudden they become enemies or we even see children become enemies and even killing the parents and so forth. Unfortunately, there are too many examples of these things. So there are actually many stories and um, we had some interruption there, but Gesha was saying you see very rich people becoming beggars and very and the beggars becoming rich like the king and so forth. All of those stories are stories that illustrate that there is no certainty, there is nothing that you can, a basis that is very, very reliable within samsara. And it's very beneficial to contemplate all these stories because actually when you become certain that there is uncertainty in samsara that helps you overcome this very strict classification of people where you say okay this is my enemy and this is my friend because when we categorize people like this it is very easy for us to generate attachment and hatred also um, if we don't consider the uncertainty within samsara it's very easy for us to have pride at the time where let's say you know we have nice people around us we have a lot of money we have wealth we have resources we have enjoyments and luxuries so considering that everything is uncertain within samsara helps to reduce attachment and hatred towards friends and enemies and also reduce this exaggerated sense of pride for whatever wealth you might have at present. Okay, so we continue now with the second fault within samsara. It's a suffering and a fault in samsara. The first one was uncertainty. And the second one is lack of satisfaction. Lack of satisfaction here means that no matter how much you enjoy the luxuries and the comfort within samsara, it doesn't satisfy you. Actually, it works in a way that it increases your attachment and you want more and more. So we have the story here of a king. It was a very powerful king. He became the king that was ruling over the four continents. But he was not satisfied with that, all that power, all that glory, all that luxury that he had. And instead, he did his best to come to the point where he had equal uh, equal status with Indra. Now, Indra is the king of the gods and he rules the heaven of 33. So this king who was ruling the four continents, he raised up to the heaven of 33 and he was together with Indra. They had similar power. But after a while, he was not satisfied for having to share the power with Indra. So he developed this thought that said, it is not right that we share. I should be the only one. And the way to be the only one is that I have to kill Indra. And by having this thought, uh, his marriage deteriorated. And through this deterioration of his marriage, he fell from the from the heaven of 33 and it is said so you know falling from there it means he lost his status as a great ruler and a god and so forth and he just fell down into this ordinary human world where was you know the original country his original origin so it is a story that shows that no matter how much he experienced he was never satisfied and kept looking for more 
So as you can see here, we are dealing with this situation. It's a very great fault in samsara, this lack of satisfaction. Another example that we can see is the example of people who are trading, let's say businessmen and so forth. If they have a profit of $10, they're not satisfied. Now they start seeking a profit of $100. If they get $100, again, they're not satisfied. They need to have $1,000. If they have $1,000, Again, they're not satisfied. They're looking for $10,000. So they say that this lack of satisfaction is actually the worst um, attribute or the worst characteristic within samsara because due to this lack of satisfaction, our attachment increases more and more. The whole thing within samsara is that we are chasing pleasures. And the reason why we chase pleasures is because we are seeking satisfaction. But the more we enjoy those pleasures, instead of being satisfied, we are more and more unsatisfied and we have to keep looking for more. So we have covered the first two of the faults of samsara, the fault of uncertainty and the fault of no satisfaction. We come to the third one, which is the, the suffering of casting our bodies again and again. So when uh, we look at that, so this is a situation that applies to ourselves as well as everybody else. There is not one place where we can say, I have never been reborn there. There is not one type of body that we can say, I have never been reborn in this type of body. There is not one type of birth that we can say, oh, I've never taken this type of birth before. We have done it over and over and over again. Everybody has has done this. So if each sentient being has repeated this countless times, we take a birth, then we die, we transfer, we take another birth, again, we die and we transfer. So if we look at, uh, let's say, if we were able to gather together all the skeletons, all, all the bodies that we had when we had fallen into the lower migrations, it is said that we will create a pile that is bigger than Mount Meru or in other, or, you know, the bones that we have would be more than the grains of the sun in the great ocean. Even if we try to count how many times we were born as humans, because we have said that finding a human rebirth is something which is very rare. And still, if we were able to amass all these human skeletons for, from our human lives, again, we would create a pile that is as high as a mountain. And if we were to able to gather the blood from all those bodies, it will be as deep as the ocean. And again, the number of times that we have taken rebirths as gods, gods in the desire realm, in the form realm and so forth, they are just countless. The next one, the fourth is repeated rebirth. So what happens is that we take a life and, um, you know, this life comes to the end, but then we have projecting karma that will cause us to be conceived again in in a new life and when that new life finishes again our karma will cause us to be conceived again and again so until we reach liberation from samsara we will have to continue taking one rebirth after the next we come to the fifth fault or the fifth type of suffering in samsara which is the suffering of descending from high to low so descending from a high to low really indicates that you fall you have a high position a high type of rebirth and then you fall from that and uh, this is something that we see quite a lot um, you know beings are reborn as uh, even as uh, gods um, beings are born as human and then at the end of that type of high rebirth they fall down in the lower migrations. Since beginningless times we have done this over again and again. So many times we have taken rebirth as a universal monarch which is you know a very powerful type of rebirth but at the end of that life again we fell down into the lower migrations. It is very hard to find rising up but easy to find falling down. 
So there is that saying that says uh, all things that are accumulated and in dispersal. So it refers to you accumulate wealth and at the end it's all lost, it, it all disappears. Um, high position ends, ends up in falling, meeting ends in separation and birth ends in death. So this actually indicates that whatever you might experience, whatever happiness, whatever luxuries, whatever high status you might experience within cyclic existence, these things are only temporary. Even if you were to experience those things for a hundred years, at the end, when you come at the time of your death, all of this would seem like a fleeting moment of happiness. It would, it would just seem like something which was so trifle, so short. And uh, we have to contemplate this because we have to see that actually there is no essence. There is nothing that is reliable within cyclic existence. So we come now to the last one, the sixth fault, which is the fault of having no companions. When we are born, we are born alone. And when we die, we die alone. When we die and we move in, into the bardo, no one will come with us. So all the friends, all the relatives, the close companions, the students, that everyone that all these relationships we have cultivated, all of these people will have to be left behind. And the thing is that for the sake of friends and family and relatives, we generate quite a lot of attachment and hatred. And from that, we accumulate a lot of negative karma. And in addition, due to these relationships, they actually become as an obstacle for us to properly practice the Dharma. So at the end, we are left with this negativity that we have created for their sake. And we are the only ones that will have to experience the maturational result of all this negativity. So when we die and we move into the bardo, no one of these, none of these people is going to share with us the resulting experiences of the negative karma we accumulated for their sake. So considering all this fault of uh, samsara, when we see that there is nothing that is reliable within samsara, we must then generally generate that, definitely generate the mind that is seeking the path to liberation. This is how this mind is created. Okay, so um, we have uh, done this contemplation of the general suffering of samsara, where we bring into mind the six faults, the fault of uncertainty, the fault of uh, no satisfaction, the fault of casting away our bodies repeatedly, the fault of repeated rebirths, the fault of descending from high to low, and the fault of having no companions. So we're going to go back into our text now. We are at the bottom of page 16, one, two, three, four lines from the bottom up. So furthermore, as long as one has attained a rebirth in samsara due to karma and afflicted emotions, that cannot transcend the nature of suffering. So as long as you are in samsara, it's going to be suffering. Since friends can transform in enemies and enemies in friends, we cannot trust the benefit and harm they do. So here is this element of uncertainty within samsara. The roles of the enemies and the friends are not certain. They cannot be relied upon. So right now they might be benefiting us and the next moment they harm us and vice versa. He continues by saying, no matter how much happiness we enjoy, we are never satisfied. Not only that, our attachment increases and this induces more varieties of endless suffering. So this is the second fault, the fault of never being satisfied. Not only we don't find the satisfaction, but also it has this effect of increasing the desire and the attachment that we have. And the more that desire and attachment increases, the more suffering it generates. 
He continues by saying, also, we cannot trust the body we have obtained, no matter how good it is, because we have to discard it again and again. So this is the third type of fault, the fault of having to repeatedly discard our body. So no matter how good the body we have, so let's say you're born as a universal monarch, like you have an excellent body, or you're born as a king, there's nothing wrong with your body, you could have a very good body. But even that is not something that you can keep is not something which is stable it has to be discarded again and again so there's not stability you cannot even rely on a good body having been conceived repeatedly from beginningless time there is no beginning to our rebirth so this is the fourth fault the fault of repeated rebirth so we take one rebirth and this is not enough at the end of that life we are going to be conceived again and take another rebirth and another rebirth so this is an endless process of rebirths uh, continues by saying, furthermore, we cannot trust the samsaric prosperity we have obtained, no matter how excellent it may be, because at the end, certainly we will have to abandon it. So this is the fifth fault, the fault of um, falling from high to low. And we say that we have seen many examples of this. You have someone who accumulates incredible wealth and power and luxuries, you know, the best there is in samsara. And then in the next life, they are born as a beggar who has absolutely nothing at all. So again, it is the fault and it shows that even this great prosperity or accumulation of wealth is not something that can be relied upon. Okay, um, the last one, sixth one, we also cannot trust friends because we will have to proceed to the next life alone without any friends. So this is the point of being without companions because we say it doesn't matter how many friends you might have in this life, at the time of death you will have to proceed alone and no friends, no relative, no one, it doesn't matter how close they are to you, they will not follow you, they will not come with you. So the reason why we consider all these uh, features, all these faults within samsara, how there is nothing that is a secure basis, nothing that you could trust because your body you have to discard. Um, those who are helpful or who are harmful, their roles are uncertain. Uh, wonderful positions, uh, wonderful possessions and luxuries and so forth, you will lose all that and even companions also those things you will have to leave behind. So we keep thinking about this fault of samsara to the point where we cannot, we can see that it is completely faulty. We cannot see any good quality, right? Because if you can generate this type of disillusionment towards samsara, then you begin thinking, how can I be free? How can I escape? from this samsara. So this is the purpose why we contemplate suffering. We continue, it says, therefore this time that we have obta obtained this life endowed with leisure and opportunity that is rare and very meaningful, I will try to attain in every way possible the precious state of Guru Buddha that is free from all samsaric suffering. I beseech you, Supreme Guru Yidam, bless us so that we can practice in this way. Due to this fervent request from the body of the Guru Yidam at the crown of your head descends nectar together with five colors of light which enter in you as well as in all mother sentient beings, bodies and minds. It purifies what hinders this realization. In particular, imagine that the special realization of this topic is generated in all our minds. So having actually considered the six types of uh, suffering, like the general suffering within samsara, we consider that there is no purpose in pursuing and rebirth after rebirth or status within samsara. So we stop here, we stop and think, like in this life, I have obtained the precious human rebirth. I was very lucky to have the opportunity to meet with a teacher. I met with the teachings as well. And therefore, it is right in this life that I should make the best effort to reach the state of liberation and the state of complete Buddhahood. I am capable of obtaining this state of Buddhahood. And therefore, this is how I should dedicate all my energy and effort. So please bless me. 
um, good data to be able to do so. And as a result of this request, as we say, we see the purifying nectars descending and completely cleaning and purifying our bodies. They remove all negativities and obscurations that hinder us for, from obtaining liberation and the state of Buddhahood. And then again, in the second phase, in the second repetition, um, we imagine that we, this, with these purifying nectars, all our qualities and realizations increase. And in speci specifically, we generate these realizations that allow us to reach the state of a Guru Buddha. Okay, so uh, we have completed here the first section, which is considering on the general suffering of samsara. And now we continue with the second outline, which is considering specific suffering within samsara. So when we say that we consider specific suffering within samsara, we consider the suffering of the six types of migrations. So again, the previous subject, the general suffering, is presented under those eight, six headings, and the specific also uh, is presented in six headings. But, so those six headings here on the specific suffering is the six types of migrations. But remember that in this uh, path that is shared with the individual of the small scope, we have already talked about the suffering of the of those who fall into the lower migration. So we have already talked about the suffering of the hell beings, of the hungry ghosts, and of the animals. So we're not going to be repeating this material. So in this section, the new information will be information about those uh, who are in the higher rebirths, so the suffering of humans, the suffering of demigods, and of gods. So, um, as we say here, we're going to begin by explaining the suffering of the fortunate rebirth. So, with these uh, sufferings, again, there is a variation uh, in terms of the heaviness of the suffering, however, and we also find a different presentation. So, in Vinaya and in the Lamrim Chenmo, the extensive stages of the path, they present uh, the human suffering as being eight types of suffering. However, here uh, we present seven out of this list of eight as being the human suffering because this actually makes more sense and it has more impact upon us. And then we have the last type of suffering associated with the other types of rebirth. So if we look at the list of seven types of suffering, according to the easy path that are related to the humans, we have the suffering of birth, of um, um, old age, sickness, death, meeting with the unpleasant, which is meeting with an enemy, separated from the pleasant, so separated from a friend, for example, uh, and not meeting what uh, we are seeking for. Okay, so as we say here, we're looking at the suffering of the humans, and the first one is the suffering of birth. Now, we have different types of birth. So you can have birth from the womb, birth from the heat, birth from an egg, and miraculous birth. In the case of humans, most humans are born from the womb, and this birth, this type of birth through the womb, is considered to be a very painful type of birth. So it's not just the actual birthing process but the whole period of gestation of the development of the embryo within the wombs which might last from anything from eight eight and a half months all the way up to nine months right and even a little bit longer than that so this whole period is a period of intense suffering and at the end when the birthing uh, takes place, it is like an intense suffering of being squeezed um, as you come, as you exit from the body of the mother. Okay, so as we say, the whole period where the embryo is developing within the womb is a period of a lot of suffering. Depending on the activities of the mother, everything seems to affect the embryo that is growing. So, for example, if the mother eats or drinks something which is very hot, then the embryo suffers, uh, you know, from intense heat. Or if the mother eats or drinks something which is very cold, the embryo also feels very cold. If the mother does
are some very in, uh, intense exercise, like for example, if she walks very fast, if she runs, if she jumps and so forth, the embryo also suffers from this movement in the body and is also terrified. So this goes on for the nine periods, nine months, the period of nine months, the gestation. Then the actual birthing is very painful and traumatic. And immediately after birth, also like the body is extremely vulnerable to all the elements and to the slightest touch. So actually there is quite a lot of suffering that is associated with birth. If you want to read more detail to on that, you can look at the sutra that is the descent into the womb sutra, uh, and it has quite a, a lot of detailed explanation of this type of suffering. Okay, we move now into the second suffering, which is the suffering of old age. So initially, we go through some years of youth, and during the years of youth, we enjoy, you know, this very good appearance, very good complexion, the hair, the teeth. We have all the strength, all the power. Nothing is difficult for us. But then as aging settles in, we find that we are bereft from all this energy and good looks that we have in our youth. So first of all, you know, the complexion, we lose the youthful color, something changes. And in addition to that, we develop wrinkles. And in general, you know, the skin and the flesh has lost its vigor. Uh, the hair turns gray, uh, the teeth uh, become deteriorated and loose, and you might even lose of the teeth. It becomes very hard to stand up. And when you sit down, it's like you are collapsing. There's a big force that causes you to sit down and everything becomes difficult. All of this is classified under the suffering of old age. There is even more suffering included under this category of aging. For example, as you age, your speech becomes unclear and incoherent. When you walk, you cannot walk straight or easily. Walking becomes, you know, a, a big difficulty. Um, the heat of the of your body and the strength of your body declines and this is uh, this also affects the type of clothes that you wear if you put a heavy clothes it just feels like a burden on the body and you only want to wear something very light and thin but then that makes you feel cold also you don't have uh, your your natural breath uh, does not have uh, any, uh, does not have power and even as you take a few steps or you do a small job you see to be out of breath. Uh, your eyes do not see clearly anymore. Your ears do not hear very well. So even though you might want to go and listen to a Dharma talk, actually you cannot hear the words. Your nose cannot detect the smells uh, properly and so forth. And anything that you touch, no matter how soft it is, actually feels very rough and harsh to the touch. So you cannot enjoy objects that you were enjoying before. So as you can see, there's quite a lot of uh, suffering included in this uh, category of old age. Uh, and this is something that we don't need to rely to the text, the lamrim and so forth. These things are manifest. We experience those things. We have firsthand experiences. If uh, there was a young person that uh, was told that they were going to their sight and become blind all of a sudden, the person would say, no, I'd better die. I could not, I could not fathom or, you know, I could not deal with the idea that I would go blind all of a sudden. However, what happens with old age is that all the senses deteriorate. The eyes cannot see, the ears cannot hear, you know, the, the nose cannot smell and so forth. The reason why we can endure it is because it sets in slowly, little by little. So because it comes in little by little, day after day, it doesn't give us a shock. The Kadampa Geshes used to say, that the good thing about old age is that it comes little by little. If it were to come on you all of a sudden, you would not be able to tolerate it. 
The next one is the suffering of uh, sickness, the suffering of sickness when sick, again, is something that we know from experience, direct experience. But when sickness uh, strikes the body, then everything, the skin dries out, the flesh loses uh, uh, its power, we waste away, we don't have any strength anymore, we experience a lot of pain and so forth. Especially if uh, the illness is a long-term illness, one of the things that we observe is that the like the the patience of the of the person who is sick seems to be getting very thin so this person becomes quite angry and they keep uh, scolding other, the people who are around them they speak in very harsh words and so forth because the elements within the body are out of balance out of equilibrium uh, physically they experience quite a lot of pain and mentally they experience quite a lot of anguish and even if the illness is for a very short time, nevertheless, the experience of the ill person is that this illness goes on for a very long time. And at night, they cannot sleep. And it seems like the night goes on forever. We have all had experiences like that. We come to the next one, which is the suffering of death. At the time of death, what happens is that this body that is made out of flesh and bones and skin, uh, at this point, all these elements seem to be breaking apart and becoming loose. Uh, during the day, you cannot rest. During the night, you are unable to sleep. Your friends and the relatives around you, they look at you and they say, oh, there's not much time left now. Even the doctor gives up on you and says, there's nothing more than I can do. As for yourself, you can also see that the end is coming. And at this point, if you have not used your life wisely, if you have not made the time to practice Dharma, you arrive at the time of death and now you have very strong regret and you can see that all the friends, the relatives, the wealth you have accumulated, all those things you have to leave behind, you have to be separated from all of this and then continue completely alone on your own. So there's quite a lot of regret and fear but then when you reach this point it's too late for that. Okay, so um, we see actually, especially for people who have accumulated heavy negativity at the time of death, that uh, it is a very upsetting time. Um, at that time, they will be experiencing very strong illness. They will be in great pain, but they also have those uh, like mistaken appearances, like hallucinations. A lot of people in this situation, they have this feeling that they are falling as if they are falling off a cliff and they might call out to the people around them saying, pull me up pull me up, lift me up. Actually, this sense uh, that they are falling, it's almost like a premonition that they are falling into the lower migration. So they have this sense of gravity pulling them down. And that is very frightful. Others have other visions, uh, frightful visions of uh, frightening beings like the Lord of Yama, the Lord of Death coming to get them and so forth. So actually, many things can bring about death. You could die due to a prolonged illness. You could die suddenly due to an accident. You could die because something that you ate or the elements or the medicine did not agree with you and so forth. There are many things that can bring about death. Now, imagine that uh, you know someone who is very good at doing divinations, very accurate divinations, and you went there and they said to you, oh, I can see that you will die very quickly. Even upon hearing these news, you will be terrified. So imagine the fear that you actually, and the suffering that happens when the actual time of death comes to you. Not just the words, but the actual experience. The next one, the fifth one, is the suffering of um, 
meeting the enemy that is uh, unpleasant. So imagine here that you meet with an enemy that, or a thief or robbers that, uh, and this thing can cause you quite a lot of pain and anguish. So you think they will beat me, they will, they will treat me very harshly. Uh, maybe they will use weapons against me. They will steal all my wealth. They will rob me or they might even enslave me. And for the rest of my life, I will have to experience a lot of suffering. So these are examples of meeting with the unpleasant enemy. So when we say, you know, considering the suffering of encountering the unpleasant. So, for example, you know, the king um, with a lot might impose uh, some very taxes, uh, very high taxes on you, and uh, you might end up losing all your wealth, separated from your wealth. Or, for example, in the country that you live, there might be a war or famine, or there could be, you know, different problems, and you meet with some unfavorable conditions. Other people might uh, meet with uh, great fires, or with earthquakes, or with, um, you know, great... Uh, you know, bodies of water and so forth. So meeting with uh, those unfavorable, frightening situations. But even those who are ordained, they, um, they might experience this type of suffering, the suffering of meeting with the unpleasant. So, for example, they might um, have to encounter a lot of negativity or they have to face a lot of afflictions within their continuum. They might meet with misleading teachers or they might meet with non-virtuous friends. So for someone who's ordained and has to protect their vows, all those things are unpleasant situations. They endanger the vow. So it is a case of meeting with the unpleasant. Uh, the next type of suffering, the sixth one, is separation from the pleasant. So imagine pa the parents who have a child and it's a very beloved, adored child. So imagine now the situation where the child dies and the shock of the parents when they get those news. Some of them might faint on the spot. Others might be even driven to madness. Uh, lose their sanity. Others might cry for months on end, completely wasting their eyes. Or it could be the opposite situation, that a child loses their parent and, um, you know, they lose all the protection, all the affection that the parents uh, were providing. Or you could have a situation where a family breaks up or you could have a situation where a king loses all the wealth and the status and so forth and become a beggar, or someone who is very poor, very rich, uh, becomes very poor, or um, uh, you might lose your wealth and separate it from your wealth because someone has the power to take it away from you. So all these are cases of separation from the pleasant. Also, this type of suffering of being separated from the pleasant exists for those who are ordained. For example, they might be separated from their faith. They might lose their faith or they might lose their morality or they might be separated from their teacher or might, they might be separated, separated from virtuous companions and so forth. So that suffering still exists. We come to the seventh one, which is the suffering of not getting what you want. So we have many examples of this. So let's say someone is a farmer and they spend a lot of time cultivating the fields and they put quite a lot of energy and effort into cultivating something, but then the hail come or the rain comes at the wrong time or there is too much heat and so forth and all their efforts are destroyed. So at the end, although they have planted the seeds and they have plowed the fields, at the end they do not get any crop at all. You have others who work with animals and they might have big flocks of sheep or cows or horses and so forth. And again, um, you know, they try to increase the number of the the animals but there come thieves who steal away the animals or they come illness because the animals do become sick and they also suffer so they don't get what they're looking for and you even have businessmen who have to travel uh, in for profit but due to bad conditions of the elements at the end they make no profit at all and they have to borrow money instead of making any money 
Now, we even have, uh, for example, the poor who are suffering from not getting what they, what they want. So they're seeking for some food, but they cannot get the food when they're out begging. Or you might have even the rich people, those who have a lot of resources. Uh, because of this uh, tendency that they lack satisfaction, they keep looking for more wealth. They keep looking for more resources. So this drive they have for more and more creates a lot of suffering. And even when they obtain those new items and luxuries that they're looking for, it is very difficult for them to maintain them, to safeguard them. There are many enemies, they are thieves, and of course, you know, they are the elements, there are many conditions that can take those away. So they suffer in order to accumulate and they suffer in order to protect, but at the end they lose. So as you can see here, when we talk about possessions and wealth, those who have it suffer and those who do not have it also suffer. So it doesn't matter if you are someone at the top, like very rich, very powerful, or if you are somewhere in the middle, or if you are someone very low, in any case, you're going to suffer from that. There is something that the seventh Dalai Lama, Kelsen Gasso, has said. He said, whoever, whoever you see, high and low, meaning whether you see someone who is very powerful, very rich, or whether you see someone who is very poor, ordained and lay men and women, whether their surroundings are impressive or not. So they could be living in a palace or they could be living in a very, you know, in a tent, right? Their share of human suffering is the same. They appear unhappy to their friends and equals. So it doesn't matter who you are, man or woman, lay or deigned, high or low, you know, you have the same amount. Everybody suffers. Okay, so um, remember here that we say we have obtained a human rebirth, a human body, and this type of human body and rebirth can be used as a boat, the boat that can help us escape and cross samsara and be liberated from that. But other, if we do not use this existence, this human rebirth, in order to find the path that leads to liberation, other than that, if we miss this opportunity, even this human body is a source and a place of a lot of suffering. Okay, so um, we have to be determined and generate that thought that says, I will use this human body, I will use this human existence in order to find the path to liberation. So uh, today we were talking about specific suffering uh, and in particular, within specific suffering of samsara, we're talking about the human suffering. As we say, in the great Lamrim, Lamrim Chenmo, and in Vinaya, there is a list of eight types of suffering for the humans. But here, we have an enumeration of seven types of suffering, the suffering of birth, of old age, of illness and death, the suffering of meeting with the unpleasant, the suffering of being separated from the pleasant, and the suffering of not getting what we're looking for. So it has been a session that was filled with suffering from beginning to end. It was all suffering, 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 every sentence. But suffering is something which is very important. We must meditate on this suffering. It's absolutely. You see the Buddha in his first teaching, he's teaching the four noble truths. And the first noble truth is the truth of suffering. So the first sentence was, know that this is suffering. So in other words, he's introducing suffering. We need to be introduced to suffering because we don't recognize it as suffering. And if you do not see it as suffering, you will not have the wish or the determination to escape, to be free from that suffering. And therefore, it's very important that we do meditate on this suffering. But it's heavy, but we have to meditate upon it. Okay, so today was the suffering of humans. And in the next class, we will be looking at the suffering of demigods and gods. And if you have any questions, please send them along the usual way.